Hello and welcome to Original Sound Chat, where video game music is a work of art. On each episode, it's our goal to help you learn about two soundtracks from the world of games, as well as the people, stories, and critical tracks behind them. My name is Joe DeVader. And I'm Peter Spasia. We're brought to you by Anonymous Dinosaur and Rhymes with Asia. It's time to appreciate great OSTs and the games they come from without getting too bogged down in music theory. Joe, what are this week's games? Up first is a game that works very hard to help you become the knight, or at the very least, become the Batman, 2011's Batman Arkham City. Following that is 2009's Assassin's Creed II, the annual solidification of the historical open world series, featuring one of the most charming protagonists in video game history. That's right, the theme this week is sequels to ambitious titles. Certainly, we've talked about Batman Arkham Asylum before and what it tried to do for, uh, you know, superhero video games going outside of the movie mold. And Arkham City certainly delivered on that and then some for its sequel. And then Assassin's Creed with its open world platforming character interaction 2 took it to a whole other level. Great games this week. Great soundtracks. Joe, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, all things considered. Uh, it's been a heck of a week. Just started school, but hanging in there, making it happen. Busy week also at Nintendo World Report. Uh, oh, we've been boy. churning out videos and reviews. About to have a busy month. Yeah, September is going to be something else. So definitely check out our work there over at Nintendo World Report. We wanted to add a new segment to the top of the show as well, because over 30 some episodes, we've kind of developed a a slew of composers that we have talked about. And of course, these composers don't really stop working. They continue their careers and they continue to be brought up uh, in different contexts, new projects, new things here and there. So we wanted to take some time at the top of the shows going forward to mention if there are any headlines out there with any composers, any games that we've covered previously. So let's start with Austin Wintry, and uh, he is composing the game Erica. Uh, and Erica was a stealth launch during Gamescom. $10 uh, used to be a PlayLink game. So one of these live action shot interactive games where you can control with a controller or a second screen like a phone app. Uh, it was one of these ones I'd had my eye on for a long time, but then saw Austin Wintry promoting it. It's like, yep, I've been working on this. And it's like, well, yeah, now I need to get it. And I've I really enjoyed it. So I think if, if you're looking for more Austin Wintry work, there's your in there for Erica. I haven't had a chance to play it yet, but it is definitely on my radar again because, well, A, because you uh, mentioned it to me and brought it to my attention, but B, because, I mean, Austin Wintry did it, so I'm interested now. Very much Until Dawn-like, too, I think, as far as, like, the collaboration with a friend sitting on the couch. Great stuff. Outside of that, for any Cuphead fans out there, if you go to cupheadnotes.com, uh, Studio MDHR and Christopher Madigan released some of the sheet music for some of the music in Cuphead for use... Uh, by high school bands and professional bands and stuff like that which is really cool trust me when i say that video game sheet music is hard to come by props to them for doing this this is super awesome if you wanted a high school jazz band to perform one song from the cuphead soundtrack what would it be i think either carnival kerfuffle or uh ruse of ooze mm, very interesting i would go with the king's court or whenever I think of Cuphead sheet music, I think of uh, Floral Fury. Mm -hmm. So that would, that would be really interesting. Lena Rain has released tracks for her upcoming project that she's associated with. Uh, this is Chicory, A Colorful Tale. Uh, and by the way, also Celeste is currently free for a limited time on the Epic Game Store. Some people may have certain misgivings about that, but if you want to play Celeste and experience that, it's free. So absolutely there. But uh, Lena Rain's new tracks, fantastic. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've they're on Spotify if you want to hear the samples that she has already put out. Uh, the game looks ridiculously adorable. Looking forward to it a lot. Uh, also, this hasn't happened at time of recording, but by the time this comes out, it will have happened. This was announced a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Darren Korb and Ashley Barrett at PAX uh, performing a concert alongside an orchestra conducted by Austin Wintory. Huh. So what, tracks from Bastion, Transistor, uh, it's so good, so good. Mm -hmm. It's it's supposed to be, I believe he said, to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of uh, 
of Supergiant Games. So I wish I could be there so much. <laughs> it sounds amazing. Hopefully this video. That does sound really good. And it's actually kind of related to a show announcement uh, where we are thinking of producing extra content samples here for original sound chat beyond just our weekly installments we're looking to do monthly rollouts of a couple different show formats and that's going to start ho hopefully very soon by the time you hear this hopefully one of these will be out uh, and that would be we're, we're trying to line up monthly interviews with some of the composers we've talked to uh had a couple already but just kind of kind of space them out here so by the time you hear this we did get to interview darren korb and that was super awesome <laughs> It was so cool. So hopefully you get to hear that. Uh, you know, we had a, a great time. Hopefully you get to enjoy listening to that too. But there'll be some bonus tracks coming to the original Sound Chat YouTube channel for Rams of Asia and also on podcast feeds through Anonymous Dinosaur. Mm -hmm. And then to bring it down real quick, uh, very recently, some allegations came out about some individuals that were on our list to cover eventually. I won't name any names if you don't know what I'm talking about. Cursory internet search, look into it. Um, needless to say, uh, these people are no longer on our list to cover in the future. Uh, this is a show about celebrating game music and the people that made it, and uh, I don't... I think it's easy to say that these people are uh, not all that worthy of being celebrated. Mm -hmm. That's a, I think it's a very fair point. So yeah, had planned on talking about some of those those games, some of those people, but not anymore. You're right. Well, let's get into talking about games and soundtracks and composers that are great. Let's start with Batman Arkham City. Yeah, let's talk about Batman. So, uh, Batman Arkham City was originally released for the PS3 and Xbox 360 on October 18th, 2011. It would later see a PC release in November of the same year, and then in November of the following year, 2012, it would see a Wii U release. Uh, and then in 2016, it would also see a PS4 and Xbox One release, I believe alongside Asylum, uh, which is what it's a sequel to. It is a sequel to the massively successful game Batman Arkham Asylum, which was itself released in 2009. In what is becoming a trend for games that I've talked about on this show, uh, Batman is yet again another one of the biggest characters and most well-known characters in the world. Uh, he is probably number three when it comes to most well-known superheroes on Earth, probably behind Spider-Man and Superman. I think that's fair. He first appeared himself in comics in 1939. Uh and has since been the subject of probably more cartoons, more TV shows, more films, more video games than pretty much any other superhero in history, if I had to take a guess. I don't have any firm numbers to confirm that, but that sounds right to me. I can't think of anybody who's been in more stuff. He has been famously portrayed in live action by Adam West, Michael Keaton, Val Kilmer, George Clooney, Christian Bale, Ben Affleck, as well as a bunch of other people. Uh, there were, did you know there was a Batman movie before the Adam West stuff? I didn't. I learned that. It's like a black and white film. That is news to me. I never knew it existed. For anybody that grew up on cartoons like uh, Batman the Animated Series, or Justice League, or Batman Beyond, or anything like that, uh, you may be more familiar with uh, him being voiced by one Kevin Conroy. Likewise, uh, his most notable villain, the Joker, is probably the most famous comic book villain on Earth. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's no probably about it. He's the most famous comic book villain on Earth. <laughs> uh, he has been played live action by people like Cesar Romero, Jack Nicholson, Heath Ledger, Jared Leto, and he's even getting an upcoming film starring Joaquin Phoenix, which could go either way i don't <laughs> know how to feel about that movie uh i'll go see it i'm curious enough sure i just don't want them to portray him as a sympathetic figure because he got beat up when he was trying to make it as a comedian like that's not the point of the joker mm -hmm. uh, the point of the joker is that he had a bad day and took it uh in the way you're not supposed to take bad days mm -hmm. uh, so but for the most part 
If you're thinking of Joker, it's it's very likely that the voice you hear in your head is that of Mark Hamill, a.k.a. Luke Skywalker, <laughs> which a lot of people still don't know that. Yeah, he's just had a tremendous, prolific voiceover career, uh, you know, with Joker being one of the more prominent roles. But then you think, I got Fire Lord Ozai is another mm. one from you know Avatar The Last Airbender. Uh, it was even referencing at a, like a trivia game. They were talking about like the, the remake this year of Child's Play. And it's like, yeah, did you know Mark Hamill voiced Chucky in the new Child's Play? Because he did. Uh, mm-hmm. So he's he's got quite the career. Yeah, he's a he's a very established voice actor. In fact, I would say that uh, after Star Wars, Mark Hamill kind of uh, found his real footing in in voice acting. And thank God for that, because he is the best Joker. There is no better Joker. I love Heath Ledger. I like Jack Nicholson. There's no better Joker. Mark Hamill is the Joker in my heart. Uh, Basically, these characters are a really big deal. But, much like Spider-Man, had the problem of most games that came out starring Batman sucked. (laughs) uh, Because they were having the same problems that originally Spider-Man games were having. They were being rushed out to meet the release of certain media, like movies or TV shows and stuff like that. And like, look, publishers i get it but stop doing this it makes bad games give the game as much time as it needs this is why people were super excited when warner brothers announced that a game was in development under the then basically new studio rocksteady that a batman game was being made and it was not being made to match up with any release of any film or anything like that It was a game being made to be a Batman game and nothing else. Before this, by the way, Rocksteady had only made one game. It was a PS2 and Xbox game called Urban Chaos Riot Response. And it was a first person shooter that basically reviewed as. Is that right? I guess. Like 74 was the highest matter, was the highest score I saw it get. So. Kind of weird that these people went to Warner Brothers and said, we want to make a Batman game. Here's our pitch for a Batman game. And Warner Brothers said, all right, yeah, here's the money. Do it. Must have been a really, really impressive pitch. Uh, And I'm glad because Arkham Asylum put them on the map. Uh, It's a great game. It was critically and uh, commercially successful. Uh, It follows... The Joker taking over Arkham Asylum and Batman having to make his way throughout the facility to stop him. So, of course, with that being a success, Arkham City, the sequel, was a no-brainer. So what is Batman Arkham City? Arkham City takes place one year after Arkham Asylum, uh, in the aftermath of Joker's takeover of the Asylum, in a section of Gotham City that has been cordoned off and turned into a basically a super prison being referred to as Arkham City because people in Gotham don't have a huge amount of creativity uh, unless they're evil and then they have way too much of it with the creation of this new super prison they take all of the inmates from Arkham Asylum and all of the inmates from Blackgate Penitentiary and they just shove them together and throw them into this this city, basically, and say, deal with your own crap. And this goes about as well as you could expect. Uh, at the very beginning of the game, Bruce Wayne is arrested while giving a rally to work for shutting down Arkham City because, obviously, it's a bad idea and Bruce knows it. <laughs> and he he realizes that he can do more in that situation as Bruce Wayne than he could as Batman. But he's arrested and thrown into the prison himself. And is uh, he comes face to face with the head of the prison, Hugo Strange, who reveals that he happens to know that Bruce Wayne is Batman. And thus begins an adventure to uh, go all around Arkham City and stop all of the villains that are all doing their own thing Uh, and all seem to have their own little schemes going on within the city before the mysterious Protocol 10 that Hugo Strange keeps referring to uh, begins. 
So, this is the point where I will ask, what are our experiences with Batman? With Arkham City specifically. I played Batman Arkham City all the way through for the first time this year. Ooh, boy. So, uh, my, <laughs> my first experience with Arkham City was my first time with an Arkham game. And, uh, you know, our, our friend group at the time loved this game. Understandably so. I gave it a shot and really did not give it a fair shake. Uh, I stopped on that one way too early, uh, despite buying it at launch. Uh, <laughs> so when Arkham Knight rolled around the sequel in 2015, everyone was talking about that too. I'm like, yep, I'll give that a go. And I played through it and I beat it and really enjoyed it. So when I got uh, the Return to Arkham collection... Super cheap, by the way. If you're wondering how to best play these, I, wait for... This is going to be a kind of a, a theme, but wait for this game collection to go on sale because it goes on sale super cheap. I'm talking like $8 cheap Jeez. for Return to Arkham, which is Arkham Asylum and Arkham City, as you said, for either PS4 or Xbox One. So got that and comes with all the DLC. Uh, you can't beat it. It's, it's fantastic. So I went back and I'm like, if I... Played and loved Arkham Knight. I gotta love Arkham City, right? And I totally did. Oh, it's it's such a good game. <laughs> I don't know what I missed out on before. I still haven't gone to Arkham Asylum, which is more of like a, a confined mansion Metroidvania-like in a way, but I'm sure I would enjoy that. Arkham Asylum, by the way, 10 years old. Just hit the 10-year anniversary. Uh, yep. That's that's crazy uh, to think how quickly time is flying. Oh, man, yeah, for playing Arkham City for the first time all the way through this year, had a great time with it. I I think it's one of the, the better video games out there to get into. And I want to know what Rocksteady's doing. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> we'll never know. We don't get to know. Indefinitely. Uh, I played Arkham Asylum a little bit, uh, but got stuck and couldn't figure out where to go. I don't remember where. I have to go back and replay it and try it again. Um, because I did enjoy it, but I got stuck and stopped playing. And then when Arkham City came out, man, I was there on launch night. It was probably, I'm pretty sure, one of the first midnight releases I ever went to. Uh, you know, back when they were at midnight. And <laughs> it sucked for everybody involved. I love Arkham City. Loved it when I first played it. I've played it a couple of times. But what I unfortunately have to come out and, and be a curmudgeon about is I hated Arkham Knight. Mm. Ooh, I hated it. <laughs> I I played it a couple years after. I played it about a year after it came out because my roommate bought it and I just borrowed his copy. And ooh, I was not a fan. Driving the Batmobile is fine, but those Cobra Tank stealth missions, ooh, ooh, easily the worst part in any any Arkham game. I still remember to this day, Ben bursting into my room, looking at me wild-eyed and saying, Tank stealth missions! Batmobile stealth missions! And then he just <laughs> walked back into his room and closed the door. Kept playing. <laughs> he was so mad. And then I realized why when I played the game. Yeah. So, love Arkham City. Need to replay Arkham Asylum. Hated Arkham Knight. Never played Origins. Likely never will. I don't even think they ever fixed it. I'm always tempted, especially with how much I enjoyed City. But yeah, I don't, I'm not sure they did. And then I think of that Deathstroke fight. And a lot of people love that Deathstroke fight. But ooh, I am not a precision Arkham <laughs> combat person. I, I, I do decently well, but uh, more of a masher than a precision mm. button presser. That's me too. So the concept of Arkham City was actually thought of uh, by the development team before Arkham Asylum was even done. Uh, in fact, you can find an Easter egg in Arkham Asylum, uh, in a secret room in the warden's office, you will actually find plans and a blueprint for Arkham City. And apparently the layout on that blueprint is very, very, very similar to what would end up in the final product. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, the game actually began development in February of 2009 uh, as they started to to pull team members away from Arkham Asylum as they were finishing their work on that game. 
to start work on City. Uh, and the goal was to take the gameplay from the Asylum's enclosed spaces and uh, put it into the wide open streets of Gotham. And as according to them, as soon as they programmed the ability to have Batman glide between the buildings of Arkham Asylum, it just the transition was natural. Like, obviously, they could figure it out from there. No problem. And it, it just worked really well. Uh, the team chose not to involve the Batmobile as they figured that uh, gliding would probably be plenty to get around the small cordoned off area of, of Gotham. Uh, meanwhile, they also figured that Batmobile probably wouldn't work in all the broken terrain they had planned within the city. Uh, and also, because they wanted such a focus on gliding, they figured that giving Batman a car to drive around in would make it a completely different game. And guess what? Turns out, in 2015, they proved themselves correct. <sighs> Sorry, I'm just very salty about Arkham <laughs> Knight. <laughs> um, so, this bigger focus on gliding uh, became very important and happened because, as they put it, cities quote-unquote virtual footprint was five times larger than Arkham Asylum's and they needed to make sure that moving around the city felt good and cool which they did uh it it they succeeded with a bullet it's so fun to get around in Arkham City I love it so much uh gliding doing the grapnel boost is probably one of the most satisfying traversal abilities in video games, in my opinion. Oh, gosh, yeah. It, the gliding is uh, not great at first, but yeah, when you get grapnel boost, oh, game changer. It's it's super good. Uh, in terms of story, Kevin Conroy described it as being close in nature to the film Batman Beyond Return of the Joker, which is known for being among the darker Batman animated films. Uh, it's also my personal favorite. Um, if you've never seen that movie, it's super, super good. Uh, and it's, it's probably some of Mark Hamill's best work as the Joker. Like, mm. by far, it's super good. So, one thing that I found super interesting is that while deciding which gadgets to add to Batman's arsenal for this sequel, they, uh, tended to ask themselves, would Batman actually use this? Is this something that Batman himself would design and then use? And if the answer was yes, they tinkered around to see if it worked within the context of gameplay. This was especially important when tinkering and retooling one of Arkham Asylum's most notable flaws, that being detective vision. So one of the main complaints about Arkham Asylum, one of the main criticisms was that Detective Vision was actually too useful. In fact, it was so useful in Arkham Asylum that most people played a majority of the game with it on. Hmm. And that's not ideal, and uh, hid a lot of the environmental work that they had done, and just made the game look like a neon mess uh, with skeletons. Or as I wrote in my notes, a neon skeleton party. Uh, so... They considered a couple of fixes for this. First, they uh, wondered, would it work if we put a timer on detective mode? And then thought, why would Batman put a timer on his own <laughs> gadget? That's stupid. He'd, he wouldn't do that. So they threw that idea in the trash and instead uh, tweaked it so that detective vision would be inconvenient in certain situations. For instance, if you have detective vision on during a fight, and then you get hit, the screen blurs because of static, because you, know, you just got hit on the thing that's displaying the images. Uh, which, I think, actually worked. I didn't use Detective Vision very often in Arkham City unless I was actively trying to find something, which is what it's supposed to be for. Yeah, I didn't either. I think that's, that's the right fix. They did a good job with that. Mm -hmm. The game also features a large amount of side missions, which is my personal favorite part of the game. Uh, often involving the other villains locked in Arkham City. They said they wanted a, a large pool of villains all doing their own thing because they actually wanted it to feel like you were actually trapped in this supermax prison with all of these supervillains basically free to do whatever the hell they want as long as they stay in the walls. Hugo Strange specifically was chosen as the main antagonist because of his, uh, his nature 
made him perfect to be in charge of Arkham City. He's a he's a corrupt psychologist who uh is very manipulative and and persuasive and stuff like that. And yeah, you're right. You mentioned that voice of Protocol 10 will commence in. And it's just like it's a mm-hmm. it's a constant presence and it it's really cool, really cool framing. Uh we also mentioned, you know, the the side missions in the Spider-Man episode and like how they really should have taken a page from Arkham City in this page. So yeah. it all kind of ties together there. I, I really wish the Spider-Man missions were like Arkham City uh, because it's literally exactly what it sounds like. You can fly around and find other villains doing their own thing. Uh, villains such as Bane, Victor Zaz, Poison Ivy, Mr. Freeze, Two-Face, the Riddler. A, a whole bunch of people. And this is this is even aside from the Joker and Penguin basically being side antagonists all their own it's just so good uh this is also notably the final piece of media where the character harley quinn was voiced by arlene sorkin who had been playing the character since her debut in batman the animated series yes that's right harley quinn was never in the comics to start she is now but she was originally created to be a side, like, just a side mook for the Joker in Batman the Animated Series, and then she got so popular that she just sort of became this mainstay Batman character. Uh, and Arlene Sorkin voiced her all through that, and, uh, like I said, this was her final her final time in the role. Uh, from here, the role was handed to Tara Strong, who is also a very talented voice actress, who uh, played her in the Harley-based DLC for Arkham City, and also continues to play her in most roles today. There are a couple places where she does not play uh, Harley Quinn, but for the most part, she is the voice of Harley Quinn. And Catwoman is also involved in the story as a playable character. Originally, her sections of the story were released as DLC, but later later releases of the game just packaged her stuff into it. Oh, super controversial at the time. Tied into oh, yeah. online passes and... You can only get it with new copies, but if you get it after, it's $10. Oh my gosh, what a mm-hmm. mess. But it's it's important for the pacing of the story. Uh, but yeah, glad it's certainly included nowadays. Yeah, it's, it's not like a side campaign. It's scenes that happen during the game. <laughs> it's really weird the way they did it, and uh, whatever. But still, like playing as Catwoman, super fun. Uh, it's a really nice change of pace when you do have it. Also, Robin and Nightwing are playable characters in various DLCs. I believe Nightwing is just in, like, Enemy Arena stuff. But Robin is playable in the Harley Quinn DLC. That DLC is garbage, but he's in there. <laughs> and he also makes a brief appearance in the in the story, too. Right. Uh, I believe, specifically, he's Tim Drake Robin. Yes. Yes. Apparently, the game's marketing was designed to reach, quote, an audience outside of superhero fans. Now, I know what you're thinking. Joe, why are you acting like that for that? Of course they'd want to do that. That's smart. An appeal to the type of gamers who play things like... Call of Duty! Specifically name-dropped in their marketing plans that they wanted to go for the Call of Duty fans. Hey, why? Your game's not Call of Duty. Your game's not even the same genre as Call of Duty. <laughs> and I don't get this. Why are marketing why are marketing departments like this so often? Why are they so out of touch like this? Well, I mean, if you watch Jim Sterling content, you know exactly why. It's you know, game publishers aren't content with making some money, they want to make all of the money. And especially back then, uh gosh, there's the three games that you know, all the publishers want to be like, there's Call of Duty, there's uh, Clash of Clans and Candy Crush. Mm-hmm. And like, it's it's trying to focus on that. So, yeah, I think it's ridiculous, but it's uh, it's capitalism. <laughs> like the idea that a marketing that people that work in marketing for a living looked at this and said, hey, first person shooter fans, you want to come play our game, our third person stealth action Batman game? What do you mean, no? Because Batman has a third-person electro gun that he shoots to solve puzzles. (laughs) You like guns? We have a gun. 
just uh, stupid, stupid, stupid. But marketing stupidity aside, uh, Arkham City released to critical and commercial acclaim, much like its predecessor. It was one of the highest rated games of the year in a year already packed to bursting with fantastic games. Like we have mentioned multiple times on the show that 2011 was just a landmark year for releases. Yeah, yeah, big year. Portal 2. So much stuff came out that year. <laughs> Skyrim. Uh, Skyward Sword came out that year. Um, Uncharted 3. So many, so many games in 2011. Uh, so to be one of the higher rated games of that year, that's something. That's something to brag about. Two sequels uh, to the Arkham City would release later neither of which really managed to reach the same critical acclaim as Asylum or City. Uh, Batman Arkham Origins, as we mentioned earlier, (sighs) released with a bunch of really average reviews riddled with technical issues. Uh, It's a game that takes place a year before Arkham Asylum, had a bunch of controversies before it even came out with, like, Kevin Conroy wasn't Batman. I believe it was... uh, it was roger craig smith yep Mm -hmm. the current voice of sonic the hedgehog (laughs) and we'll we'll talk about him more later (laughs) yeah and then troy baker as uh as the joker um because arkham asylum was originally supposed to be the the game after which mark hamill was gonna retire playing the joker that didn't quite work out he still does the joker quite a lot yeah city was supposed to be the last one, and but yeah, you know he keeps keeps getting work. Uh, Troy Baker, very good Joker performance in that one, actually. So I've heard the little I've seen, he does he does a good job. That is like those two being controversies is not to say that they did a bad job. It was just that people are really attached to Conroy and Hamill's performances. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, I remember a big controversy with Origins being like, "Hey, you gonna fix the game? Uh, we'll fix the game if the DLC does well." Yeah, that's that's always been garbage. Like that was one of the worst. Like I can't believe somebody got paid to tell somebody. Yeah, no, that's a good idea to say. Unbelievable. Uh, and then Arkham, Arkham Knight released in 2015. Uh, it was meant to be the end of a trilogy. I think. I don't know if that's going to remain the case. They could be making another Batman game right now. We literally have no idea what they have been working on. <laughs> I'm I'm dying to know. Uh, they recently teased something about oh the, gosh they put it in quotes too is something related to Justice League it was like Justice for All. Uh, they that would put be something cool. in quotes and it's like oh man like don't don't do us like this don't tease us like this and I would love to see what Rocksteady is working on next for sure. Also got to give a shout out to Batman Arkham VR. Uh, it was another Rocksteady project that they put out in the earlier days of like PlayStation VR. Uh, if you can find it for cheap, definitely give it a shot. I really enjoyed it. Very brief experience, maybe 45 minutes. Uh, but the ending was fantastic. Loved it. <laughs> so uh, definitely recommended there. And it's not Rocksteady at all, but Batman media, Batman games continue to go on. Uh, you know, Telltale released two seasons of a Batman game with uh, Batman the Telltale series. And the second season, The Enemy Within... Uh, if you have not played that and you're a Batman fan, give it a go. One of the best interpretations of the Joker. Oh, my goodness. Uh, shame about Telltale. But that <laughs> series is great if you're a Batman fan. I've heard it's some. it was some of their best work uh, when it came out. I haven't played it. I should. You'd lo- you would love it. I heard good things. The music for Ark of City was, was done by two individuals. Um, one being... Nick Arundel, who is who we're uh, focusing on, sort of, not really, you'll see why in a second. And also Ron Fish uh, did some of the pieces as well. Uh, but mainly, the main, the main composer of Arkham City was Nick Arundel. And for the second week in a row, I got nothing. Nothing. Dude's a ghost. This is the le- I'm not even sure he's real. I would not believe he was a real person if not for the fact that one of the few things I did find was just a video for the BAFTA website of of him saying like this is uh this is what we did on Arkham City. 
but I couldn't really find like anything usable out of that video. I think it was mostly just supposed to be fluff for an award show uh, or or specifically meant for like if you are going into this specific career field, this information will be useful to you. Uh, and that's the only like thing I can find on him. I can't find when he was born, where he was born. He's, he appeared to be English uh, from the from the sound of his accent. Uh, and it doesn't help that most of my search results uh, came up with a different Nick Arundel, who apparently used to work for CBS and was also a White House press uh, correspondent. It's not the same dude because this Nick Arundel died in 2011. Mm-hmm. So his discography is uh, he I he did a couple of games, but I only really recognized uh, Battalion Wars. Oh, OK. The GameCube game. Uh, and then he has also done Asylum, City, and Night in the Arkham series. He did not do uh, Origins because I don't believe Origins was Rocksteady. I think that was a different studio. It was WB Montreal, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he didn't have anything to do with that. He was working on Night at the time. Uh, but that's all I can find. That's it. It's it's really unfortunate when we can't find, like, but that's just the nature of of video game composers just aren't as high profile as some other other fields, which is a shame, but nature doing business. All the more reason why, Nick, if you're listening, we'd love to talk to you. Reach out to us. Yes, please. Talk to me about Batman. I want to know. Uh, so as for some stuff uh, about the actual soundtrack itself, two albums were released alongside the game, one being the game's actual score, which are the songs that we're using here, obviously, and one being, so you know how, like, when a movie releases, they'll release the the original score of the movie, but then they'll release an album that's like these artists wrote music based on inspired by songs inspired by. Yes, yes. They released one of those for for <laughs> Arkham City. Uh, the album includes tracks by Panic at the Disco, Coheed and Cambria, as well as a bunch of other bands I don't recognize because I don't know mainstream bands. Because <laughs> I'm I'm an old person now, I guess. Must be for that Call of Duty crowd. It must have been. Does anybody buy those? No. Like, why do those exist? Who are those for? (laughs) Though, to be fair, on the Spider-Man 2 movie soundtrack, songs inspired by I Really Like Dashboard Confessionals Vindicated. That's the (laughs) credits and credit song of that movie. I'm a sucker for that one. I don't know. Well, see, at least it's in the movie then. (laughs) Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Like... Who are those who are those tracks for? Anyways, let's get into our five critical tracks. That's all the information I could find on on the composer and the soundtrack itself. As for our five critical tracks, our first one is no better place to start than the Arkham City main theme. This song plays on the title screen of the game, uh, and it just, it screams Batman. I still remember getting home at about 1 a.m. on launch night, putting this into my PS3, waiting 25 minutes for it to install because the joys of owning a PlayStation, and uh, just getting super pumped hearing this song for the first time. I'm pretty sure I played till like 3 a.m. that night. Um... And it's just this this really nice triumphant piece. The strings are super good. The swells are wonderful. And it's just one of those songs that's like, are you ready to fly over the streets of Arkham? Because I am. Let's do this. This is definitely one that had to be here. Uh, it makes me think of when I was doing podcast Game of the Year stuff back in 2011. And uh, this was a, a big award winner amongst our group of friends. Uh, and but you know using this theme consistently and such a good theme like i remember listening be like how did i not get into this game exactly (laughs) uh yeah such a good one this is like the definitive track of this game had to be her uh number two 
is a monument to your failure. This is one of the uh, couple songs on the Critical Five that was composed by Ron Fish. Uh, in a way, this is Hugo Strange's theme, basically. Uh, it plays at the very beginning of the game as Bruce Wayne is being sent into the city and learns that Hugo Strange is aware of his secret identity. It's got this sort of vulnerable, creepy feel to it, which is really fitting for, you know, the theme of Hugo Strange. And uh, it, it only comes up to its triumphant swell uh, near the end of the song, which I imagine is when you are beating up the penguin, mm-hmm. but I don't remember for sure. Because that's, that's, that's a really memorable moment where you're walking into the prison for the first time and Penguin's like, oh, look who it is, Bruce Wayne. Well, time to kill him. And then you just beat the crap out of him. <laughs> Shouts out to Nolan North. Uh, great work as a penguin in the Arkham universe. So, dude got paid in 2011 between that and Uncharted 3 with Nathan Drake. Um, but yeah, you know, great moment uh, in that, and especially uh, you know Strange's bone chilling uh, admission that he knows the secret. Uh, so good. Uh, yeah, it's quite the way to start a game for sure. Mm-hmm. Number three is the court is now in session. I believe that this is the song that plays when you fight Two-Face at the very beginning of the game and his goons, uh, because one of the first things you do is track down Catwoman, who is being, if I remember correctly, like hung over a vat of chemicals or something, Mm -hmm. and Two-Face is getting ready to shoot her, and you have to swoop in and and save her. Yeah, the first Catwoman section, actually. Mm -hmm. I think that it's a good indicator as to how, like, battle songs in this game are going to sound uh because it's the the frantic strings and the the same large swells you hear in the rest of the soundtrack and and most of the other battle music in the game sounds like this definitely definitely uh yeah this one played and i could absolutely picture that courthouse with two-face uh two-face troy baker these stars are (laughs) all over the place it's a great cast i'm telling you um yeah no i could picture this one perfectly uh yeah such a good one and uh, I'll, I'll talk about Catwoman music in a little bit, but uh, this is a great battle one against these Two-Face goons. For number four, we have the music that accompanies my favorite moment in the entire game. Bring her back to me. <laughs> Once again, composed by Ron Fish, this plays during the Mr. Freeze boss fight, which is the coolest part of Arkham City. Uh, or at least it felt cool at the time. Yeah, you know, it is it is a really it's a, it's a really cool, not to do the whole Schwarzenegger pun, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a very cool moment. Uh, but I find it interesting in the time in between when I you know, stopped playing the game. And when I picked it up again this year, a lot of people are like, it's the greatest boss fight I've ever played. It's one of the greatest of all time. And when I went back to play it, I'm like, 
it's good, but it is not all time boss category. Yeah, I wouldn't put it in the greatest all time. Like, it's only good because yeah, you get to use all the different tricks and Freeze learns. So you can't use the same techniques. Or, yeah, so yes, yeah, you have the versatility, you use the space well, and he is a formidable foe, but it's not an all-timer. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't think it would be an all-timer, but I do find it. I love that it's, like you mentioned, his whole gimmick is like, if you hit him a certain way, then he will make it so that you cannot hit him that way again. So like, if you pounce on him through a window, he will then proceed to break every window in his lab. Or if you dive down on him from, like, one of the gargoyles on the walls, uh, he will then destroy all of the gargoyles on the walls. <laughs> or not destroy, but he'll he'll cover them with ice so you can't use them anymore. Right, right. And it's just a really cool sort of method of of doing this boss fight. And also just the voice modulation they do on Freeze during Ooh, the fight. Yeah. Super cool. Like, I, I think one of my favorite lines in the entire game is... You will bring me Nora or you will die as it like boots up the modulation as his helmet turns on. Oh, it's so good. Uh, and the music is, is pretty good. The atonic strings, I think atonic is the word I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. We're like, they don't really have a, they're not playing a note so much as they're playing a sound. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's meant to sound creepy and cold, you know. Like Mr. Freeze. Uh, and I just, mostly this song is on this list because it's a very notable part of the game, uh, which is the same thing I could say about our next song, number five on the list. It's not even breakfast. Spoiler time! Yeah, it's spoiler time, everybody. If you haven't played Arkham City, I mean, it's almost 10 years old. I'm sure you've heard the twist by now. You've probably heard the twist. Uh, the Joker dies at the end of the game. Uh, so the whole game is, is well, most of the game is basically based around uh, the Joker has Titan poisoning from using a, a performance-enhancing chemical called titan in arkham asylum he he overdosed on it and now he is dying because of it and he uh gives batman the same titan poisoning and says there now you have to look for a cure because otherwise we're both gonna die and at the end batman of course gets gets the cure he gives it to himself and then he starts to question like should i give this to the joker if i do he's just gonna hurt people He's going to hurt more people. He's going to get out eventually. He's going to hurt more people. And Joker, through his selfishness and impatience, uh, lunges for the cure, knocking it out of Batman's hands as it hits the floor, shatters, and is gone. And Batman, in his final moments, looks at Joker and says, You want to know something funny? Even after everything you've done, I would have saved you. And then Joker dies. <laughs> And like this play is like when you're carrying him out uh, mm -hmm. onto the streets. Uh, so good. Oh my goodness. Not a great final boss with Clayface yeah. and the sword, but the ending has a terrific impact. I uh, kind of undid it a little bit in Arkham Knight, which kind of makes it a little light on the, you know, real spoiler bit because like it's, it's eh, Joker's still a threat, uh, but. It was it was big for the time. See, I kind of like the way they handle it in Arkham Knight. To be fair, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. one of the thing. That's one of the few things I do like about Arkham Knight. Yeah, it plays at such a pivotal and memorable moment in the game. Uh, and apparently, the decision that the Joker was going to die at the end came very early in development. Uh, and Warner Brothers approved it only if it a was not done for shock value, and b was made very clear. 
that Batman was not at fault for his death. Uh, and they, they managed to do both of them. I mean, it sort of is still shocking because cause it's, you know, the Joker died. Wow. <laughs> uh, it, takes, it takes a lot of balls to kill a character that iconic. Just such a good scene. And so this song belongs on there just for that alone, even though it's less than a minute long. Right. Yeah, they do lean into it throughout the game so it's not entirely shocking uh, it's more yeah you're right shocking for the fact that like whoa they actually did it it's a it's a very very interesting thing and it's probably among the more memorable things about arkham city now as for cutting room floor you got one tell me of it yeah so this is uh, a catwoman piece of music it's called sorry boys It's the cat. It's just the bat, but it's the cat. Uh, so yeah, DLC issues aside and how controversial it was. Uh, it was so good to have Catwoman in this game, just to reiterate that. And Grey Delisle's performance. Look, I, I love different Catwoman performances, like Laura Bailey in the Telltale game. So good. But Grey Delisle is the ultimate Catwoman as far as like animated or in-game performance. Uh, just fantastic. And that little bit at the end of the clip there with the plucking of the strings, the dun, 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 just kind of imitating these light cat-like footsteps. Like it's one of these moments on the soundtrack that like really stands out to you when you're playing this different character. And it's like, oh, we are not getting the the big brass chords like Batman. We're, we're stealthy. We are extra sneaky. So I like that one a lot. Uh, for me, I got two. One is, have you got my location? Uh, this plays when it's time to suit up uh, as you are making your way up to a rooftop to grab uh, the bat suit and prepare to actually start the game as Bruce Wayne at the very beginning. Uh, the buildup of this song, I think, mirrors uh, your walk as you get closer to the gadgets and all that. The The song gets more and more, just more and more. I don't know how to, ex I don't know how else to explain it. It's very good. And you should have listened to my warning. Which I think is just the regular battle theme. I think. Yeah, just out in the streets, regular goons. Mm-hmm. Uh, either way, it's great. Uh, this one is is a shame that I had to leave it off, but I think those five up there had to be there. Uh, but this one definitely probably would have been my number six, for sure. Uh, it's a very good song, and it just feels good to beat up goons to it. Great picks. Great picks, absolutely. So what will I never forget about Batman Arkham City? Uh, for a long while, I think I would have called this among my top 10 games of all time. I don't think it's sitting there anymore. Uh, I think it's probably somewhere within the top 25 now, if I had to take a guess, if that list even had any real form to it. Um, I, I still do love the feeling that it gives you of being Batman. Uh, and I still think that his rogues gallery is the best in superhero history. And so having this game where you can just go around a city and mess with them. Is super fun. I don't know. I didn't like Arkham Knight. I never played Arkham Origins. So one day, maybe Rocksteady will bring back the the mojo that made Arkham Asylum and Arkham City so good, or they'll come at us with something completely different, and it'll be great. I don't know. I really don't know. I am super hopeful. Whatever it is, 
Me too. I think uh, I've got a lot of hope, and I, I believe in them. You can do it, guys. So, for our transition, we like to uh, highlight a fan cover or remix, whether it be from OC Remix, YouTube, what have you. And uh, for this one, I managed to find a violin and piano duet of the main theme. It is from YouTuber MusicMike512, and uh, duets are really great. I don't know what more there is to say. All right, from the bat and the knight to a different kind of stealth much more lethal by the way <laughs> <laughs> just a tad we're gonna talk about assassin's creed 2 now as we approach this busy month of september 2019 in the video game industry i was originally going to talk about a different sequel that being borderlands 2 uh, but things then happened in the game industry, and we're like, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't support bad actors. Uh, so you know what? We're not talking about Borderlands 2 anymore. If you want, you can blame Randy Pitchford. It's okay. You can blame Randy Pitchford for a lot of things, allegedly. I think <sighs> his ego can take it, allegedly. So I- I'm looking at different scores from Jesper Kid because uh, we still want to talk about him. Great man, Jesper Kid. And I got to land on this one. Uh, It's arguably his most famous score. It's my, uh, you know, one of my favorite games in one of my favorite series. And uh, out of the works that he did for Assassin's Creed, like this, yeah, this is the one that stands out. We can also tie it into the fact that game director for Assassin's Creed and Assassin's Creed 2, Patrice Desolet, uh, has his new game, his new project, Ancestors, the Humankind Odyssey. It's out now. So we can tie it kind of into that for some relevance. Uh, Apparently a very interesting game, that one, that it's very hit or miss. Uh, But I don't know, go go check out Ancestors. So when we're talking about Assassin's Creed 2, it is the sequel to the 2007 game Assassin's Creed. Uh, This game begins the Ezio trilogy, uh, followed by 2010's Assassin's Creed Brotherhood and 2011's Assassin's Creed Revelations. Uh, This game also was such a big hit, and it really propelled the Assassin's Creed series onto the gaming world stage, that it also began the annualization of the franchise, and that ran every year with big main installments until 2015's Assassin's Creed Syndicate, which we also talked about previously on this show with Austin Wintory and his score. So Assassin's Creed 2 released in North America on PS3 and Xbox 360 on November 17th, 2009. Yes, we're coming up on the 10-year anniversary of this game, and that is crazy. Uh, Europe and Australia got the game on November 19th and 20th, respectively, so very close together. And it released for PC on March 9th, 2010. It was supposed to release on PC at the same time they delayed it so that it could be optimized and, you know, made the best that it could be. Uh, but the PS4 and Xbox One version of Assassin's Creed 2 were made part of the Ezio Collection, which was a re-release of the trilogy upgraded for HD consoles. Uh, you know, there's they were already HD, but you get the point. Uh, for PS4 and Xbox One, that was released on November 15th, 2016. The down year in between Syndicate and 2017's Origins. Uh, this is a game... Uh, the SEO collection in particular, where we talk about Return to Arkham and how it gets super cheap on sale. Wait until the Ezio collection goes on sale. If you're itching to play these three games, uh, I got the Ezio collection for $10 on PlayStation Network. Like, <laughs> I think they go for 50 normally, and that's like, that's a little much. $10 is a steal, though. So, again, wait for good sales if you're looking to pick up that one. So, Assassin's Creed 2, developed by Ubisoft Montreal, published by Ubisoft. Oh boy, it's a third-person action-adventure game that 
takes place in these connected open world cities. Uh, gosh, if you don't know what Assassin's Creed is, I think that's the best way to describe it. Players are able to interact with these cities by climbing buildings, performing parkour, free running to move about the world, all while you are stealthy or you use a variety of weapons to take care of enemies, depending on what your current assassin mission requires. Now, if I had to explain <laughs> the, the plot of the game, it was one thing to talk about Assassin's Creed Syndicate because it was so entrenched in the Assassin's Creed lore. But here we're talking about the second game in the series and trying to build off the first game, which kind of established a, a sort of narrative framework. So here, I think, is the best way to describe it for those that don't know. The Assassin's Creed games at their core, at their most basic in these earlier installments, uh, really overall, they involve an ongoing war throughout all of history between the Assassins, which is a group who believe in personal freedom, free will. And then there are the Templars who want to rule humanity through control. Which one's the bad guys? Take a guess. Most of the time, it's very clear. <laughs> Sometimes they like to mix it up a little bit. Uh, in the modern day of the story, which took place generally like in the same year as the games were coming out, uh, the Templar company Abstergo, uh, they've captured a young bartender named Desmond Miles. Once again, played by Nolan North. So there you go. The, the connections grow. There's the real theme. Nolan North. <laughs> Nolan North. So Abstergo has captured this man named Desmond Miles because he has a valuable DNA lineage. The idea of Assassin's Creed is that characters use a machine called the Animus. And when a person uses the Animus, the user can relive the memories of their ancestors with their DNA through simulation. Now, these memories can hold secrets that are lost to time, uh, such as the location of powerful artifacts called Pieces of Eden. And this is the Templar's true aim to discover where these pieces of Eden are in the modern world so that they can use their power to control humanity. Uh, but because Desmond has this rich lineage, uh, this involves going back to particular assassins through time. And so at the beginning of Assassin's Creed 2, Desmond is rescued from Abstergo captivity by a group of assassins who want to train him to be an assassin so that he can fight back against Abstergo, against the Templars. Now, to do so, Desmond must gain these skills, you guessed it, inside the Animus. But this time, instead of the Third Crusades in the first game, this takes him to the era of the Italian Renaissance in the late 1400s through his ancestor, Ezio Auditore da Firenze. Uh, Ezio's journey begins with the murder of his father and his brothers uh, by the hands of a corrupt magistrate. And so this leads Ezio down the path of learning how to become an assassin, just this path of vengeance that inspires him to investigate and hunt down everyone responsible for the male members of his families and, and their deaths. Now, this will take him uh, across Italy, across different parts of the world, uh, have him meet different Italian figures throughout history, such as Niccolo Machiavelli, Leonardo da Vinci, the Medici family, and Rodrigo Borgia. Uh, so the, the main questions here are, can Ezio find the truth behind what happened to his family? And what larger secrets will he uncover at the end of his journey? So, Joe, here's where I ask you, what are your experiences, and we'll talk about my experiences, with Assassin's Creed 2? It's the only Assassin's Creed game I've played. Okay, it's not a bad one to start on. Uh, I played Assassin's Creed 2. Uh, enjoyed it. I believe I still own it. I think it might have unfortunately been a victim of the era when I was still trading in games. Ooh, that era yep. ended long ago, but I lost a lot of games that way. Then I played Brotherhood through Gamefly at some point and just didn't like it. And I don't remember what it was about Brotherhood that made me not like it. Maybe I should go try it again. I don't know. But I just, it didn't gel with me. And then from there, I didn't play Revelations. 
I didn't play three. I remember hearing y'all talk <laughs> about three <laughs> and, and the way most people describe the death of a family member. Uh, <laughs> um, I didn't play Black Flag, though. I borrowed Black Flag for a while, but I never actually played it. I'm told that game is very good. Easily the best PS4 launch title. Uh, I didn't play Syndicate. I didn't play Origins. I didn't play Odyssey. So it's, I didn't play the first game either, it should be noted. Why? You didn't play Assassin's Creed Unity? You didn't play Rogue? <laughs> I forgot Unity existed, to be quite honest. <laughs> That's sort of how that went. Uh, I prefer my parkour uh, games to star a raccoon with a cane. Aha. Uh, and that's really what it comes down to, I think. <laughs> See, for me, this is the game that really got me into the Assassin's Creed series. Um, I have an Assassin's Creed belt. I'm wearing an Assassin's Creed shirt. I love this series so much. Uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, easily my most played game of last year, even into this year. I think I'm, I passed the 130 hour mark on that bad boy. Uh, so yeah, big, big love for this series. Uh, and this is the one that uh, it's it's a really good starting point, point. Uh, and it's one of the better games in the series. Again, even ten years later, which is really hard to believe, but uh, it's it's certainly one that I'm I'm very pulled to, especially when I didn't want to reward a certain egomaniac talking about a certain <laughs> franchise. So <laughs> let's uh, kind of dive into the development history of the Assassin's Creed Two game. Apparently had a development team of about 450 members, which is a lot of people. And it's also triple the amount of the team working on the first game. Assassin's Creed games nowadays, these days, uh, Ubisoft has so many studios around the world. And so they outsource different aspects of the game to all these different studios. So the teams are, are massive now. But uh, 450 back in 2009, it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people regardless working on a game. The game was officially revealed through Game Informer uh, on April 16th, 2009. There was the E3 2009 cinematic trailer that was shown on June 1st. Uh, this started a trend. I mean, you know, the first Assassin's Creed trailer, like, that, was, that was good. But it was Assassin's Creed 2 that really began a, a series every year around E3 of must-watch Ubisoft Assassin's Creed CGI trailers because they were always among the best in the business. And boy, this one, when it starts in the carnival and, uh, you know, hunting this, this Italian figure and you have the whole thing of Ezio dropping from the sky and doing the superhero landing pose, such a good trailer, but yeah, I mean, they would only get better from there. Uh, the, the CGI work just, just top notch. Fantastic. I remember even unity had a really good, like CGI trailer. Oh, that, I think that one's my favorite. That c cover of Everybody Wants to Rule the World with Lord fit amazingly. But yeah, it was just a trend you know, year after year. The, I mean, the recent ones with Origins and Odyssey, like, yeah, they're, they're okay. They're fine trailers. But there was something special about those E3 years where it's like, oh, what's Assassin's Creed going to do with their cinematic trailer this year? It's just best in the business. They also had a six-minute gameplay demo that showed that year at E3 2009 during Sony's press conference. Ironically enough, I went back to watch that bit of the conference, and did you know that Assassin's Creed 2 is what followed the infamous agent announcement from Rockstar? Yeah. I did not. I, I didn't either. Uh, you know, everyone points back to like, oh, oh, agent, this, this Rockstar game coming to PlayStation 3. Oh, oh very cool. Well... Assassin's Creed 2 and its gameplay demo was what immediately followed uh, from, from Jack Tretton there. So uh, this covered a sequence where uh, Ezio is using Da Vinci's flying machine to traverse the skies and enter the Palazzo Ducale in a very flashy way in order to assassinate Carlo Grimaldi. Uh, it's, it's pretty similar to what happens in the game, but a little more liberties, you know, which is kind of condensed here for the E3 uh, demo specifically one of the best parts about this game is the double hidden blades not a thing in the first game but it was even a thing in the demo where when you were c coming up to two enemies and you had the hidden blade i mean that's a, it's a staple 
weapon for the Assassin's Creed series, but to have two of them and just stick both of them, oh, it was like it was a good crowd reaction moment in that demo, and it's still always so satisfying to pull off in game. Love it, love it, love it. I still remember the uh, the cutscene in the game because I guess in one like the blade required you to like cut off your middle finger or something. Mm-hmm. Yep. And Da Vinci jokes about that. And he's like, no, nah, I'm kidding. I fixed it. So you don't have to do that. That's stupid. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was a thing in uh, the original game. I think it was the ring finger. Um, but just so it has a means of, you know, when the blade comes out. Uh, yeah, no, it's a good thing. L- da Vinci's a good dude. Da Vinci's a good dude. Um, one of the moments that a lot of people also like to point out, it's something that happens very early on as a, uh, Ezio is, you know, basically chased from his hometown because, you know, with the death of his family, he's a a wanted man. So he uh, finds solace in Monteregioni, where he's kind of building this estate uh, with the help of his sister kind of running things. And there's his mother and uh, his uncle, Mario. And so there's there's a famous cut scene where uh, his uncle Mario is like, oh, you don't recognize me? It's a me, Mario. <laughs> and it's like completely <sighs> unashamed. Like they know what they're doing. But man, like it's a little corny, but you got to love them for it that they even went that far. Like big big dude, mustache, Italian the whole way. I mean they had to. They yeah. had to. Yeah. Just just had to. It's also interesting at the time where like games are becoming more cinematic and trying to cast certain actors so i don't know if you remember this listener out there but Kristen bell was in these early assassin's creed games so she returns for this game of course uh reprising her role as lucy stillman so yeah before she uh was anna and frozen (laughs) she was in assassin's creed and we mentioned on a past episode of original sound chat that danny wallace the humorist uh, it was a notable casting addition for this game with the role of Sean Hastings. Later, he'd become the narrator for Thomas Was Alone. But uh, for his character of Sean Hastings, there's also Rebecca Crane, part of that assassin's group that rescues Desmond from Abstergo captivity. So there were also other pieces of Assassin's Creed media around this game as they were trying to build it out into more of a multimedia experience. There were three short films that appeared on YouTube called Assassin's Creed Lineage, uh, kind of leading up to the game. These were based on the backstory of Giovanni Auditore, uh, which is Ezio's father. And then there was Assassin's Creed Bloodlines. And a lot of people don't talk about Assassin's Creed Bloodlines, but that sure was a spinoff game on the PSP that released on the same day as Assassin's Creed 2. I didn't know this game existed. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I've never heard of this. It continued the story of Altair, the hero from the first Assassin's Creed game. And it was only notable in the way that if you linked this game with Assassin's Creed 2, you could unlock six unique weapons for Ezio to use in Assassin's Creed 2. That was about it. Nobody ever really talks about it. I certainly didn't realize it existed or had forgotten. And, uh, but that's important to note. Going back to play Assassin's Creed 2, it's crazy to think that it's 10 years old. And yes, it's certainly still a little rough around the edges. They've made so many refinements to the Assassin's Creed game since then. But it's still a very playable game. I mean, it's playable, it's enjoyable, it's kind of these Ubisoft open world game at its at its basic roots. So many open world elements from Assassin's Creed became elements in other Ubisoft open world games. And it's kind of interesting to see like the really the foundations of all of that. Uh, like I said, if you're looking to go back and experience it, I think the original Assassin's Creed is very rough. Yes, it was a very ambitious game for its time, trying to envision this open world. Uh, but honestly, just watch a summary of the story. Uh, get the gist of the Altair character at the very least before you play the third game in the Ezio trilogy, Revelations. Uh, and yeah, wait for that sale on the Ezio collection. Absolutely. Assassin's Creed 2 is the highest rated Assassin's Creed game on Metacritic. 
with a 91 on the PS3 version and a 90 on the Xbox 360 version. It sold 1.6 million copies in the first week, which was a 32% improvement over the first Assassin's Creed game. And as of May 2010, 9 million copies were sold, surpassing the original. Uh, it won Best Action Adventure Game at the 2009 Spike Video Game Awards. And it was nominated for a whole bunch of other categories, honestly, because 2009, Uncharted 2, Among Thieves year, for just winning all sorts of Game of the Year awards. So, a, a great game and a good time for games, but you know, kind of passed by some better games. Uh, still a very, very solid entry in the Assassin's Creed series. Uh, and yeah, it, it really took that series to become one of the juggernauts of the industry. Ubisoft's biggest franchise, for sure. Uh, and yeah, again, you know, it's a sequel to an ambitious installment uh, for the original Assassin's Creed. But it also has the interesting legacy bit of Assassin's Creed 2 being the first game to be tied to Ubisoft's Uplay service. Mm. Rather than, whether that's, you know, the, the PC service, but it was primarily more for the kind of bringing all the Ubisoft games under one hub, earn rewards for extra, you know, your coins and then rewards in this way. But uh, kind of started that whole thing and then had some weird PC DRM controversies to go with it. But that's all part of, of that. When we're talking about the music to Assassin's Creed 2, we're talking about the composer, Jesper Kidd. Uh, Jesper Kidd was born Jesper Kidd Jakobsen, oddly enough. Uh, born February 3rd, 1972 in Horsholm, Denmark. Country we haven't talked about yet. Yeah, so that's a first. Uh, Jesper Kidd learned music on a piano at his parents' house at a, an early age. And he said, you know, when he was traveling to different family members, pianos seemed to be everywhere. It was not that, you know, family members were musicians, but pianos were just a thing uh, around the houses. Uh, he spent several years, you know, training in classical guitar, note reading, choir singing, and classical composition for a piano while growing up. But it was when he was 13 where he discovered the Commodore 64 computer uh, and used it as a means for composing his own music. And later he would use an Amiga. Now, this was exciting for him because there were certainly more possibilities to layer different types of tracks for music, more than just two hands on a piano, certainly. Uh, but he tinkered with making music for game demos with friends before he left with those friends to help establish the game company Xyrinx. Uh, he eventually moved to the U.S. to do this, over to Boston, uh, at Xyrinx, they worked on some Genesis and Saturn games, uh, the first being 1993's Subterranea, before eventually their publisher went bankrupt. There was a lawsuit involved. People weren't getting paid, etc. So Xyrinx dissolved. Kid stayed in the U.S. He moved from Boston to New York to set up his own sound studio, while the other Xyrinx members went back to Denmark and they established IO Interactive. IO Interactive, uh, most famous for the Hitman games. Now, yeah. Kid would uh, find work through BioWare's MDK2 or Shiny's Messiah, but it was IO's own Hitman codename 47, the first game in the Hitman series in 2000 that really made Kid feel like he was established in the game industry as a composer. So, I mean, these were friends that he knew growing up. It was easy for them to say, hey, hey, hey Jesper, come on, like, we want you to make music for this game. And, and Hitman's kind of like this vision that we want going into this, this new century. And so, uh, you know, kind of Hitman was like that entry into like, you know, big time AAA composing for Jesper Kid. It was 2002's Hitman 2 that was kind of his first take on orchestral writing, like using the Budapest Symphony Orchestra as you know, the main performers, as opposed to everything just being rooted in these computer sequencers. Uh, he said that, you know, hearing his music for the first time coming together in a concert hall after all this planning was mind-blowing, and I don't blame him, that does sound amazing. Uh, he had the next game in the Hitman series, though, 2004's Hitman Contracts. Uh, he mentioned in an interview that was kind of among the industry's first score that really used these dark electronic scores for a game and like the different reviewers critics kind of pointed out like whoa this is this is different you know keep an eye on this but then it was 2006's 
Hitman Blood Money that blended the orchestral with the electronic, kind of in line with what Kid had always envisioned uh, working on with game music, uh, just as he kind of became more and more skilled throughout his career. Uh, it, I think that score won a BAFTA. It was uh, nominated for an MTV award of some sort. So like that was like kind of really taking notice that like, all right, yes, for kids doing these really cool things with, with game music. It's one of Ben's favorite games of all time. I thought so. So I have certainly had to mention Hitman Blood Money there. <laughs> but then Yes for Kid was shown a demo behind closed doors at an E3 for Assassin's Creed. And Ubisoft wanted him to work on the score for this game. And he was amazed by the scope of what it was trying to do for a next generation game at the time. I mean, certainly Grand Theft Auto was big at the time when it comes to open world games, but it was Assassin's Creed use of, uh, of platforming and character interaction that was really something else entirely that just kind of caught kids' eye. The first Assassin's Creed score was among the most challenging scores he's ever worked on, uh, and as far as what he said in an interview, with some of the key words for the score kind of being war, tragedy, and mysticism. Those were kind of the, the driving themes there. Now, Jesper Kid is currently based out of Burbank, California. I would say experimental kind of really defines his creative process. He prefers to write these atmospheric, moody pieces that really draw out the emotion. Had a lot of, you know, fitting quotes about, you know, when when a piece of media, whether it's a game, you know, film, whatever, if it's emotional on its own, sometimes you don't need to mess with it. Like you don't want to mess with the scene's emotion, but you definitely want to do what you can to either amplify uh, a scene's emotion or even subvert expectations. So uh, certainly all part of his process there, but it's really all dependent on the project. And it's why fans and, you know, those who are reviewing his work uh, really note Jesper Kidd's wide range of sounds and how like no song really sounds the same from each other. Like it's just really... A, a wide variety of music that Jesper Kid can can create. So, of course, it makes sense that he has plenty of influences uh, from different composers, such as Ottorino Respighi, Igor Stravinsky, Jean-Michel Jarre, Van Gillis, Mike Oldfield, John Williams, Jerry Goldsmith, and bands such as Royskop, The Knife, Pink Floyd, and Underworld. Fun fact, uh, Royskop is... Uh Again, at least it was uh, one of Ben's favorite bands. And also, yeah, Igor Stravinsky, baby. Firebird Suite. <laughs> Absolutely. So good things to be inspired by. Absolutely. And I'd like to give a shout out to the YouTube channel Gameumentary, uh, another video game documentary channel in the vein of No Clip out there, but uh, really had a great interview with Jesper Kid on their channel. So I wanted to give them a shout out. And if you want to hear, Yes, we could kind of talk about his process, uh, a good interview to look up for, for gameumentary there. Yes, for kids discography, a uh, bunch of standout video game scores. Certainly when it comes to the Assassin's Creed series, there's Assassin's Creed two brotherhood and revelations, uh, revelations. He co-composed with Lauren Balf. There's the Borderlands series with one, two, the pre-sequel and coming out soon. Borderlands three. We mentioned the Hitman series with Codename 47, with Two Silent Assassins, with Contracts and Blood Money, State of Decay, the first and the second game. There's also games like Darksiders 2, Robinson the Journey, and uh, Warhammer, Vermintide, and Vermintide 2. Uh, there's also films and short films and TV series that he's worked on. Uh, one that he wanted to highlight on his website was this recent 2018 film from India called Tumbad. Uh, but the different films and TV series, not any I had heard of. But if you're interested, check out uh, his website there. I, you know, he's all over the place. Social media, all that. Yes, for kid. So the historical development research for Assassin's Creed 2 and its score. Uh, it, kid says that it's his favorite project he's ever worked on. Like, that there was such a positivity about the development group that everyone knew that they were part of something special. And for the Italian era, you know, romantic was a driving keyword for for a AAA game, which is unusual for those kind of projects. Uh, but yet, it was really effective for driving that kind of emotion. 
It was recorded at Capitol Records with a 35-piece string ensemble and a 13-person choir with featured vocals by Melissa Kaplan. And yes, her solo voice is all over this score, and it's amazing. She did a, a great work, fantastic performance, all captured wonderfully. Now, it was important for Jesper Kidd uh, in his kind of research into the Italian Renaissance. You know, he didn't want to go too hard into the music from the time. He didn't want to listen to any of it. In fact, he hadn't really listened to any Italian Renaissance music. Uh, for him, he thought if he listened to enough Italian Renaissance music, some of it might slip into his composition. He didn't want any of that. But he did want to do a lot of research into the historical era. Um, and that would kind of inspire, well, there's you know, there's some opera at the time. We want to put his own twist on that. And thus, you, know, you have Kaplan's voice being the take on opera for the time being. But he really wanted this current modern sound for the basis, especially when Assassin's Creed is rooted in this modern story, especially in these early games. The later games, the modern Abstergo stuff is not that important, but in, in these earlier games, it absolutely is a driving force. So it's important for it to be based in modern times, but have these elements of, of a certain historical era. So it's one of the more interesting scores, one of the more famous scores, absolutely, in the Assassin's Creed lineage of games. And we'll start when it comes to the five critical tracks with the first track, with the most famous track in the franchise, Ezio's Family. Like, look, this is the theme that came to define the Assassin's Creed series. So, if you had not heard it before, uh, consider me shocked because you may have <laughs> not been paying attention to Assassin's Creed and its music. I honestly think the track Earth is my favorite song from this soundtrack. It opens the soundtrack, it uses this Ezio's family leitmotif, and it goes harder with the instrumentation, but... I, I have to put this on the critical five because this was a transcendent piece for a, a series that did not have a an iconic recognizable theme in the first game. And then this one just became the one going forward for a long, long time. This is one of the only ones that I'm really familiar with. Um, and I mean, obviously, easy to see why. It's, yeah, it is a fantastic piece. Uh, I believe the first time I heard it, was on one of those epic music uh, YouTube <laughs> channels. Um, and I wouldn't have known it was Assassin's Creed if it wasn't called Ezio's Family. Yeah, it's it's a excellent piece. Uh, it's a theme that Kid said is mostly written about sacrifice, which makes sense considering Ezio's story. Uh, and he said it's really transcended its original writing. Uh, it must have been one of those ones like he didn't expect it to be as big as it became, but it certainly did. And this takes place especially memorably in the game at the title splash. Um, you know, it kind of takes place a little bit into the game, but uh, you know, the, the logo pops up and it's, it's this, this great melody, um, you know, guitar, strings, choir, it's all here. It's really the definitive, like the Arkham city main theme. Like this is might as well just be Assassin's Creed two's main theme for the second track. We go then to Venice Rooftops. So this takes place during races in Venice. And I think it's interesting, you know, this game in particular makes you think about the Italian 
versions of these famous cities. So, uh, Firenze, you know, where Ezio Auditore da Firenze of Florence. Uh, when you think of Venice, in this game, it's Venezia. So, uh, when when you see certain things come up, uh, Roma is another one you know, for Rome, obviously, which is big for brotherhood. Uh, but I, I certainly go back to thinking about things like Firenze, like Venezia, uh, and it's all back to this game. So, so you're in Venice and you're having like these races there. It's also notable in the beginning of the game when you have to race against your brother uh, to this clock tower and you climb up the clock tower and then that hits you with the title splash. But um, you know, a lot of people associate this with races and obviously the Ezio's family theme returns here, but there's just more of a driving percussion, uh, here to show just more activity, just a, a more intensity. Like there's like a chase in a way going on. So very, very good, memorable theme. Yeah. Uh, and the, the part where Ezio's family comes in is super cool. <laughs> um, that's just that, that light motif is really, really cool no matter how many times i hear it and uh that's definitely the standout moment of the song for me Mm -hmm. it's also one where on youtube channel comments whatever it's like oh chills at this moment when that (laughs) shit comes in so yeah it's very very good and one a lot of people remember from this game just like they also remember venice escape So Ezio does some things in this game that are against the law, and uh, he has to be chased by guards with his uh, notoriety at stake. So uh, this is a piece where like the guitar really provides this really strong sense of pace. Uh, the drum and bass gets this kind of extra intensity distortion, uh, which is super cool. Just really the uh, the stakes are high here uh, because you, you have to elude capture and oh, these soprano vocals uh from melissa kaplan are just on point here so good so impressive um so it's another one that like it has this this energy to it and it's all kind of you know venice here but um gosh it's one where like you hear it and if you've played this game it's like oh yeah oh i i know this theme very well i uh it's the the bass that does it for me like that that sort of electronic what's the word for it? The boom uh in the <laughs> background. That was a terrible description, but I'm sure you know what I meant. Um that's that's the part that I think uh sets this sets this piece apart. And isn't really something you expect to hear out of a game that takes place in Renaissance Italy. Mm-hmm. And I think it if anything, like that's that's Abstergo, like kind of entering in in a way. Uh just kind of like that modern twist in there like the the simulation's about to come apart uh because Mm -hmm. Ezio wasn't captured by the law except in certain situations but uh like in a way like i I think that's if i had to guess i think that's the way of you know kind of the the modern day trying to creep in a little bit with some of that electronic so i it's it's just super super cool number four on the critical tracks flight over venice two So yes, this is using that Leonardo da Vinci flying machine. It's very bird-like wings. Uh, You're at night, you're avoiding being shot down by people with fire arrows, but you also have to use open fires to gain the elevation with, you know, the the hot air to give yourself some more air. Uh, Just a great sequence that, you know, 
just really it shows the diversity of the gameplay. Uh, just expanded even more from the original Assassin's Creed. They, one of Patrice Desilets, you know, sort of tasks for the team is like just diversity. Just expand what you can do in this game on all fronts, and uh, this was certainly one of them. Also, like Ezio can swim in this game, which makes sense with you know Venice canals and things like that. But you couldn't swim in the first Assassin's Creed. So just you know, with a couple years more of development, you know, the possibilities are out there. Uh, now there is a flight over Venice one. Uh, the instrumentation is not as grand. This one is, I think, the more memorable one. Though I guess YouTube comments were saying it's tied to a side quest in Romagna, which okay. But I always have a, a soft spot for this one. I too enjoy the part of Sly Two where you have to hit the spice balloons to make your paraglider go higher so you can land on something. I've been waiting to make that joke for like ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe one game got inspired by another. Interesting. <laughs> I think it's entirely possible, but I would not count on that. I'm not I'm not going to sit here and say that Assassin's Creed 2 got inspired <laughs> by Sly 2. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, you didn't you don't have to activate the fire to to cause the hot air. Like they're just there yeah. to help you guide the path that you should take. Uh, but so that that's very interesting. The last Track on the Critical 5 here is an interesting one, but we're going to go with End Fight. So you're beating up the Pope. Beat him up. Uh, not much of spoilers in this sense, to be honest, because it's established pretty early on that Rodrigo Borgia is this the Spaniard who has these plans of being like a, a Templar Grandmaster. And uh, look, eventually he gains <laughs> papal power. Uh, but you're in this crypt inside the Vatican. And it's such a comical fight in a way. Like, it's just not a well-designed final boss battle. Like, you just you just combo him and it's this, this old man who's, like, falling over. <laughs> and you just repeat, rinse and repeat. It's not a tough boss fight at all. He's using magic and <laughs> it's so weird. Right, right. Um, but this track in particular is interesting because it's not on the official OST for Assassin's mm. Creed 2. Instead... It was added as an AC2 bonus track on the Assassin's Creed Brotherhood soundtrack. Though it begins with this Latin prayer, uh, this like this heavy guitar. It's a very memorable piece on the Assassin's Creed 2 score. So I had to put it in here, even though it's on a different soundtrack, specifically as a piece from this game. It's, it's memorable. It deserves to be here in the Critical Five. It's super, like, I mentioned the, in the, uh, the Venice Escape song, the electronic sections. This is all electronic section. And it's really cool because of that, like, this complete change compared to everything else. Really, really cool stuff. Yeah, really upping the stakes. And then you lead to those... Crazy WTF reveals at the end of the game, which, boy, oh, boy, those are something special. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a not a tough boss fight at all, but great music to go along with it. When we were talking about tracks on the cutting room floor, uh, I think you were, we were talking. It's like you're like it's Ezio's family, it's Venice rooftops. Like you got it. Like those are the ones I remember. So uh, like that's that's just for you there. So I, I appreciate you know, at least remembering those ones. Like those are. Those are great mm -hmm. tracks to be sure. But if I had to add a couple more, I would add Home in Florence. Uh, this is at the very start of the game. You're in the Auditore home in Firenze, in Florence. It's just so relaxing. 
And it's at the point in the game where like, you're still trying to get your bearings about the world. You're trying to really master the controls, the open world, how to gain quests, and then travel throughout Florence to accomplish different tasks there. But it's just this very calming piece. And I think in a soundtrack of these different intense songs that are memorable, this is also one that you hear and it's like, oh yeah, oh, I, no, I definitely remember this one for sure. Another one of those kind of more relaxing tracks is also Leonardo's Inventions Part 2. Like I said, Leonardo da Vinci is a bro. Uh, he's your buddy <laughs> in this game. He's so cool. And of all like the different famous historical people that you meet in Assassin's Creed, like there's always a soft spot for Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, he, because he's such a great inventor, he helps to create all these different inventions for Ezio. He ups your gear. Uh, <laughs> he helps create a gun that you can shoot from your <laughs> wrist and it's amazing to take down targets i do remember that gun that gun is fantastic um but this theme it's when you're in his abode his shop and uh, you're kind of trying to figure whether it's these codex pieces that you need for the end of the game or uh you're, you're creating these new inventions it's just a very inquisitive piece like you're almost like looking into the mind of da vinci when he thinks of how to upgrade your gear uh such a really really cool piece these ones are on the softer side certainly but really flesh out the sound of this score for assassin's creed 2 and what i will never forget about this game is really how it got me hooked into what's now one of my favorite game series uh honestly i had slept on assassin's creed for a long time uh, i wasn't that interested in playing the first one and then I didn't jump into Assassin's Creed until I got my PlayStation 3 in 2011. So shortly after I've talked about, you know, L.A. Noir and the Uncharted games, Assassin's Creed was pretty much like right after that. And I played two Brotherhood Revelations like right in succession. So obviously it must have been after November 2011 because Revelations was like just out. So I got hooked hard. And then that led to 2012's Assassin's Creed 3. And you've mentioned that. Ooh, that one, that one hurt a little bit. Uh, <laughs> bit of a miss. <laughs> little bit. But yeah, when you see things like Requiescat in Pace, uh, you think about Ezio. You think about Roger Craig Smith and his amazing performance as Ezio. Like, Ezio was such a charismatic character and protagonist that certainly they were thinking about Assassin's Creed 3 following 2. But Ezio was so good, they had to milk two sequels. Out of him. So Brotherhood was like a 2.5. Revelations was like a 2.75 before they'd eventually get to a new protagonist for three. And man, Ezio is just is one of the standout characters in game history. Just oozes charm. And it's all because of Roger Craig Smith. Yes, the current actor for Sonic the Hedgehog. Yes, Batman in Arkham Origins. So many great <laughs> roles uh, for Roger Craig Smith, but Ezio's among the top. And uh, I'll never forget that I played it once. I should honestly, maybe one of these days, give uh, give them another try. Uh, I'd, I'd be willing to do so. I just... There's no time, man. So many games out there. But I, I will say, yeah, if you played one, I'm, I'm glad it is this one. Like, this is the one to at least give it a shot and see if you like the franchise as a whole. So yeah, great sequels, great soundtracks for what were really bold visions for, for games. Yeah, Arkham Asylum, Assassin's Creed, tried new things, but then these sequels just really perfected it. Uh, so very, very memorable in this sense here. So that will do it for this week on Original Sound Chat. You can find me on Twitter at Pete Speakeasy. Joe is over at the Dobaga. The video version of the show is on the Rhymes with Asia YouTube channel, also on rhymeswithasia.com. But it's that MP3 podcast version you want over on Anonymous Dinosaur 
at anondino.squarespace.com. Get the podcast version on podcast storefronts all around the globe, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, anywhere you can find it. Listen, download, whether you're on a run, in your car, at work, we won't tell your boss that you're listening about you know, great conversations about game soundtracks. It's cool. We got you. You can also hit up our social media at Soundchat OST for feedback on how we're doing with these episodes, as well as suggestions for games you'd like us to cover. Assassin's Creed 2 has to be on the upcoming Spotify playlist, the, you know, the expansions to it. Uh, what about Arkham City? Both of them. This is one of those rare weeks where both of them are on Spotify, baby. All right. So check out that original sound chat playlist on Spotify. We can't be on Spotify with the podcast itself, but you can listen to the songs that are available. And uh, that would be a good way to further your horizons with this game music. I listen to the playlist very regularly at work, just on shuffle. It's a very good playlist to listen to on shuffle. Absolutely. So when you're not listening to the podcast itself, you have those songs. And of course, bonus tracks are coming out. We talked about interviews with game composers, hoping for monthly, uh, starting with Darren Korb. That should be out by the time you get to listen to this on podcast services. And then we're also trying another format, but hopefully when we get close to releasing a first episode of that monthly, we can talk a little bit more about that. Until then, who are we talking about next week, Joe? I am burying a personal demon and talking about Keiichi Suzuki. You can't escape that, man. Like that, that's, that's just <laughs> it's just following you. I'm I'm sorry. I am talking about Kevin Reeple. So until then, we'll play you out with a YouTube fan cover or an OC Remix fan cover. And this one does come from YouTube from Alina Gingertail. She seems to be Russian based, but she did a cover for Ezio's family. I mean, it had to be this track, right? but uses some cool new instruments and uh, just sounds really, really good overall. So please enjoy that. Thank you so much for listening this week on Original Sound Chat. We'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs>